Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Y'all quiet. Y'all ready for the word of the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. So many of you have had busy days. Many of you may have had tough days. I had one of those today. But hallelujah, anyhow. Amen. Acts chapter 16, we're going to begin reading in verse 16 as well. Decent amount of reading for you this, this evening. Familiar, super familiar portion of scripture for those of you who have been raised in the church. But the Lord began to reveal this to me and I've preached out of this portion of scripture probably a dozen times. But the Lord just showed me something different. How many knows that tells us that the word is alive? I got one person. The word is alive. And we can read something multiple times and get something different every time because the word is alive and our spirits within us are alive as well and they resonate with one another. Verse 16 of Acts chapter 16. And it came to pass... As he went to prayer, this is Paul and Luke and Timothy, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. Spirit of divination. Turn to your neighbor and say, divination. Divination is a spirit of demonic, hear this, demonic fortune telling. Just just teaching you for a moment. That's not what I'm going to preach on. But the spirit of divination, people call it the spirit of python. It's pronounced pythos in the Greek, in the original language of the New Testament. But it's after the pathionic gods in Greece and in Rome. And this was a demonic fortune-telling spirit. Came a damsel with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. She was a slave. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to her, Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. And when the master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. They're in the city of Philippi and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who having received such a charge, this is a very serious charge for the jailer, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. The keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, And seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we all are here. For we all are 
hear. It says in verse 29, Then he called for a light, the jailer, called for a light, and sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what it means to your people tonight. And Lord, let us glean what your spirit has for us to receive from your word. Let us have ears to hear, hearts to receive. In Jesus' name we pray and the church says, Amen. You may be seated tonight. I want to em emphasize the fact of where Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke find themselves. Paul and Silas were arrested and apprehended. But Paul and Silas and this crew found themselves in the city of Philippi. It's in the northeastern part of Greece in the old kingdom of Thrace, part of Macedonia. I don't know if you've ever heard of Macedonia, but that's where the Alexander the Great hails from. In fact, the city Philippi was renamed from its Greek and Thracian name to be a namesake to Philip, the father of Alexander the Great. But we see, I want you to just notice this real quickly in this portion of Scripture, that obviously there's something demonic going on in the city of Philippi. Because this woman is possessed, and it sounds like she has great influence and great business because her masters were so enraged at the expulsion of this devil that they realized instantly that their money was going to run out. They were making so much money off of her that tells me that she was telling a lot of fortunes, giving a lot of demonic prophecy, if you will. Because hear me tonight, I'm, can I just teach in, 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 intermittently here? Because I want you to know the devil will have a counterfeit for everything that the Lord has to offer. We have the gift of prophecy. They have the oracles of devils. Understand that tonight. The devil has a counterfeit. We must be vigilant. But we see the city of Philippi and Macedonia is dealing with a great spiritual issue, a great spiritual need. We see that there's wicked things going on in this city. And I, I'm going to draw many parallels tonight, but I want you, if you can, for the sake of time, I, I want you to, to think of Paul and Silas as the church throughout this text tonight. And I want you to understand uh, that just as Paul and Silas were uh, in a city of wickedness, I want you to know we live in a world of wickedness. Okay, that's an easy parallel to draw. We live in very wicked times. You can turn on the news and... Don't have to watch it but three minutes and know that we are dealing with wicked and demonic things in a greater level than we've ever dealt with, dare I say, in the history of mankind. Can I get an amen? I hope you realize what time we're in. They were in this city and what began to happen is wickedness began to come after the church. A lot of times wickedness will come in, in a way that it prevents people from coming into the church, but there is also a warfare that we are involved in where wickedness will come for the church. We see that in this story that Paul and Silas find themselves being barked at day in and day out on their way to prayer, on their way to communion with the people of God and with God. They would have prayer meetings throughout the week and, and they would meet in different places. Uh, but at, the Bible says as Paul would go to prayer and as they would go to prayer, uh, that, that this woman would, would say something to them every day. And the Bible finally tells us that, that, that Paul, in verse 18, he gets so tired and sick of it. The, the New American Standard says he became greatly annoyed. Anybody ever been annoyed? I got one person in this house that's been annoyed. I've been annoyed. I was annoyed with some things at work today. 
I, I did a whole bunch of work and I come back the next day and it's all gone. It's all undid. And, and that's aggravating. That's annoying. Uh, that's annoying. But I want you to hear me. Uh, the enemy has been greatly on my nerves lately. Am I the only one? All right. It's Wednesday night. Come on. Come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. I know you're tired. I know you're tired. But I've been up since 3.30 this morning. I'm going to preach anyway. Okay. I want you to understand this. I want you to get this in your spirit tonight uh, because there's something I, I, I believe the Lord wants to reveal to us. Uh, it's not just because I'm preaching it. It's just something that preached to me, okay? Uh, I, I want you to understand uh, that wickedness has come after the church in a great, great wave. Uh, but I also understand uh, that in the day and hour that we're living in, I'm beginning to see uh, some people like Paul rise up. I'm not saying there's people that are, are, are so greatly anointed like Paul, but I believe there are people uh, that are rising up uh, like Paul did and say, you know what? Uh, I'm sick of this thing. Uh, we've seen what's happened uh, in, in, in the beer market lately. Uh, people stood up for wickedness and tried to say, uh, this is our agenda. And the people said, no, uh, that's not our agenda. Uh, we've seen seen what's going on in, in, the, in the retail industry lately. Uh, and people across this world have begun to stand up uh, and say, that's not our agenda. That's not what we're doing. Uh, don't tell me that the church is dead and dying. Uh, don't tell me uh, that God is not up to something uh, because there's some people in their prayer closet. Uh, there's some people in Connorsville in church uh, on a Wednesday night that have said, listen, I am sick of it. Uh, I've had it up to here with this. Uh, and they're willing Willing to deal with the issues uh, but understand Paul and Silas uh, dealt with the issues and the enemy came back uh, in a greater way he come back the enemy came back in a greater way they said listen we're not just going to bark at you we're going to try to grab hold of you they apprehend them they beat them anybody ever felt like you've been beat on by the enemy Amen. But I find it fascinating that they give them over to the jailer. And we're going to get to the jailer here in a minute because the Lord showed me something I'd never seen about this jailer before. And I believe it will minister to you. But understand, they hand him over to the jailer. They say, put him in the innermost prison. Uh, he understands the charge. Uh, and under, uh, I want you to know that, that, that in this culture, the reason why the jailer would stand up and try to kill himself uh, is because he was going to be executed anyway. He could not lose a prisoner. It was, it was unlawful uh, for, for really him to even be asleep. Uh, he's not supposed to sleep on duty. That's a, Roman, that's a Roman soldier. That's his charge. Uh, if he's put on duty, he's not even allowed to sleep, let alone lose a prisoner. So understand what, what, what's going on. They hand him to the jailer. And I've, I, I've always just read over this, Sister Crystal. Uh, but what I began to notice is uh, they put him in the innermost prison. Uh, and the Bible doesn't say that they shackled their hands. It doesn't say they put a gag in their mouth. It's not what it says. It says that they chained their feet. They chained their feet. Why their feet? My Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 6 uh, that, that when we put on the whole armor of God uh, that we are to shod our feet uh, with the preparation of the gospel uh, of peace. Okay, you say, what does that mean for the believer? I find it fascinating uh, that what the enemy comes after uh, and what I see him coming after today uh, is the same thing he went after back then. Uh, your feet uh, are supposed to be prepared with the good news. That's the gospel uh, of peace. Uh, you're supposed to have peace as a believer. Uh, you're supposed to have peace of mind. Uh, you're supposed to have peace and rest in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and what I see in the church uh, is an absence of peace uh, and is an absence of rest and is, is a mind that's scattered all over the place. Uh, and I find it fascinating uh, that the enemy back then, 2,000 years ago, uh, went after their peace. Uh, and here we are 2,000 years later, uh, and he's still coming after your peace. Goes after their peace. They find themselves bound up. Bound up and chained in this prison. But you're going to think this is the main part of my message and it's really not. Because what I find even more fascinating about this portion of Scripture 
is when the enemy attacks. Paul and Silas just keep attacking the enemy. Because what happens is, we all know the story that Paul and Silas at the midnight hour in verse 25 here of Acts 16 began to pray and sing praises unto God. Hear me, church, I don't care, understand. I know we go through a lot of things. We've got all kinds of stuff going on in our lives, but it does not matter what it is. There is no excuse. You hear this preacher tonight? There is no excuse for a believer to stop praying and to stop praising. Don't stop believing. Don't stop having faith. Don't stop having hope. Don't let that enemy steal your peace. The enemy grabbed hold of them, grabbed hold of that peace, that good news. And what did they do? They said, how about we pray? How about we sing praises? How about we go to church on a Wednesday night? How about we go to church on a Sunday night? Oh, there's church and revival. Let's go to church again. Let's have church at our house. Let's have church with our children. I don't care what you're going through, but you have to sit down and say, devil, you're not going to have my peace. You're not going to have what God has already given for me. You're not going to have what Jesus has already won for me. And they begin to pray and sing praises. This is where we're at, church. Because the enemy, I believe there's been a confrontation and the enemy has fought back and now he's coming after the peace of the saints. And we must continue to pray and sing praises. You say amen? Why? Why? Pastor Jade, why? Why should we pray? Why should we sing praises? You know, I used to think, read this story, and I thought it was powerful that they sang praises and they prayed and the earthquake came the prison doors flew open and the chains came off I thought that was the most powerful part about that story and it's not understand prayer and praise will bring you freedom and it will bring those around you freedom and the church said amen it will Absolutely, it will. But there's a world out there that is just like that jailer. You say, what are you talking about? You see that jailer. Can I come down here? Yes, thank you. That jailer thought he had it all together. He had the keys. He had the authority. He had the power. He thought they were the bondmen, and he was the free one. And there's sinners outside these walls uh, that think that we are bound to a religious system. And they don't understand uh, that who the Son has set free uh, is free indeed. Uh, there's a world out there that's just like that jailer uh, saying, I'm in control here. Uh, you're not in control. Uh, you, you've got to do all these rules and all these rules. Listen, they're, 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 understand this. Uh, the, the Bible says the letter uh, or the law uh, what doesn't help you, but understand uh, that there is uh, a, a power, uh, there is a freedom, uh, there is an anointing when you live a Holy Ghost filled, uh, holy, righteous, godly life. Uh, I want you to know there's freedom in that. I believe in that. Uh, hear me tonight. Uh, but that jailer uh, was just like uh, our prodigals that are lost. Uh, they thought, I'm in control. Uh, I, 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 I'm the one that's got it all together. I'm not the one that's bound. You're the one that's bound. You're the one that's got the problem. You're the one that's shackled up. But hear me tonight. The Lord began to reveal to me and He began to speak to me so stern. Yesterday morning as I began to drive to work I had a clipboard with a piece of paper and I could barely read my writing but I was driving and I was writing with the other hand because the Lord began to speak to me and He said understand this that the Taylor, the one that thought he had it all together with the church, if the church he said if my church will continue to press in, will continue to pray, will continue to sing praises, will worship me in spirit and truth, will get over themselves, understand we create 90% of our own problems, we are our own worst enemy, hear me tonight I'm not just preaching because I feel like it, I'm preaching because the word of the Lord has come to me he's visited me, he's preached 
to me. I want you to know this. I want you to get this down in your spirit. Understand what is happening when we press in and we pray and we sing praises. Why are we doing that? Because the Lord began to tell me. He said, son, you hear me. There is a shaking that is coming to this world. There is a shaking coming to those prodigals. That jailer thought he had it all together. Oh, but when this earth begins to shake, when this society and this nation that we never think will collapse begins to go on a downward spiral, believe me, there's some jailers out there. There's some prodigals out there that are gonna come to their senses and realize I'm not the one that's really free. The church is the one that's really free and I'm the one that's bound. I thought I had it together. I thought I could control what I was doing but I realized I'm the one that's enslaved. I'm the one that's in bondage. I'm the one that's in chains and what began to happen is he saw those prison doors open. He saw the chains come off. He assumed everybody was gone and he began to get desperate. He pulled out his sword and was going to end his own life. You're saying, what does this have to do with anything? Understand the desperation. He thought he could not take it anymore, that it was over. Oh, but then Paul, the church, began to say, no, the church is still here. We have not been shaken. We have not been moved, but we've been set free by the power of Almighty God. We're here for you, desperate one. We're here to rescue you. We're here to set you free. We're here to break the chains of addiction off you. Anybody in the house tonight? Anybody got some prodigals? Anybody got some jailers that think they got it all together? But hear me, if you'll pray and you'll praise, there is a shaking that will wake them up. They'll become desperate and they'll say, God, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But the church will say, we're right here. We know what you need. I know a man that can and he, what happens is that prodigal, that jailer comes into that cell, falls at the feet of Paul and he says what must I do to be saved? What must I do? Don't be surprised when your children come up here and say I'm desperate, I'm desperate what must I do to be saved? He said confess the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your whole house will be saved. Can we give the Lord some praise tonight? Oh, stand to your feet tonight. Give the Lord some praise. There's prodigals coming home. There's a shaking coming. But we've got to pray. We've got to praise. We've got to press in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm almost done. And come to the music tonight. Jailer thought he could control his urges. He didn't want to be an addict. He thought he was in control. He didn't want to be addicted to pornography. He thought he was in control. He didn't want to be an alcoholic, but he thought he was in control. Feel the shaking. Realize I'm the one that's bound. These church people that I said is in bondage for all these years, they're the ones that are free, and I'm the one that's bound. There's a phrase that is being spoken.
see something happen. because the worship team was great the preacher was great all those things are good that's not why he came home he came home because he was hungry and he said the people in my father's house they don't hunger let me put it to you this way the children of God don't hunger the way I hunger his hunger drove him back to the father's house And that jailer realized that he wasn't the one that was free. He came to Paul and Silas after they said that we were here, we're here. He said, what must I do to be saved? You know what that's a cry of? It's a cry of hunger. Here's what Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. That 
prodigal went back to the father's house. The father saw him afar off and ran towards him. Just like Paul in silence, what the father was saying is, son, I'm still here. I'm here for you. Church, when those prodigals come running, we've got to be here. I'm not talking about the physical place. We've got, to, we've got to be the church. We've got to be equipped. We've got to be in our word. Let me just teach for a moment. Don't tell me you love Jesus, but you don't love his word. And you don't read it. That You don't love Jesus. I'm sorry. Don't tell me you love Jesus, but you don't talk to him. Because I'm married and I know if I don't talk to my wife, uh, she doesn't think I love her. And vice versa. If she never talked to me, I wouldn't think she loved me. So don't tell us. Don't tell us. Oh, I love Jesus. But I don't have a prayer life. You've got to have a prayer life. I'm not saying it's got to be something big and elaborate. Start simple. Hear me. As I pray, you won't pray the same way. I guarantee it. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's going to speak to you in a way he don't speak to me. Because he knows how you understand. He knows how I understand. But church, done teaching. Understand. When those prodigals come, and this shaking, it's already starting to happen. I'm feeling tremors in the spirit. People's got a hope. And even people in the church got hopes in a lot of things they shouldn't. They're trusting in a lot of things they shouldn't. When this shaking happens, they're going to they're going to be outside their mind. They're going to be desperate, and they're going to need a church that says, "We're here." I used to think the shaking, prison doors opening, was the best part of that. Acts sixteen, the best part to me is that. Paul said, I'm here, here. The jailer took them out of the prison, took them to his house. The Bible says that the jailer and his whole house was saved and baptized. fascinating though I didn't forget where I started I started with talking about Philippi if you read the book of Philippians a city that used to have demonic strongholds God set up a church and it was a powerful church the enemy may have strongholds in this city hear me God's raising up a church that I say we're here devil stand with me tonight I want you to repeat after me stand with me tonight say devil I'm right here you say oh preacher you better be careful no he better be careful devil say it say devil I'm right here Say, devil, say it. The church is right here. We're praying, say it. We're praising. We're walking in authority. We're walking in the call of God. We're walking in the power of God. And God is greater than anything that you can bring our way. You say, oh, that's corny. You had us repeat it. I had to get you some way to declare it over your life. You got to stop being afraid to confront things. Because if you don't confront things, hear me, if you can't confront things, there ain't going to be no shaking. And there ain't going to be no prodigals coming home. You got to confront it. So what I'm going to call us to do is simply what Paul and Silas did. I want you to come to these altars. And I want you to pray. And more than that, can I stretch you? If you feel in obedience to the Lord that you just need to come up and 
Stand in front of these altars and lift your hands in praise. You praise. But Paul and Silas were not shy or backward. The Bible says when they began to pray and sing, everyone heard them. And I'll treat you like I, I treat the teenagers. I spoke to them a couple months ago and I said, understand this. There is power when you pray out loud. I believe in a silent prayer. I, I believe that. But there is power when you pray out loud. Why? Because the Bible says there's life and death in the power of your tongue. I'm not doing this to embarrass you. They're going to play. They're going to sing. But can we pray and sing praises? We all have a song. It's called the Song of the Redeemed. And I want you to come to these altars tonight. Come. I'm done. Come. Everyone that will. Everyone that will. I want you to pray. I want you to praise. And just say, God, I'm not only I, I'm being set free, but not only am I being set free, my lost nephew, my lost cousin, my lost father, my lost mother, my lost grandmother, grandfather, my lost brother, my lost sister, Lord God, my lost children, my lost grandchildren, my great nieces and nephews. Uh, God, I'm pr I'm praying and praising for them. Let the chains come off their life. Lord, everybody, Pastor Ron coming to you again. Thank you for joining us today. I pray that the word was a blessing to you. And today, before we say goodbye, I just want to encourage you. If you have not yet put your faith and trust in the Lord, that this would be a time that you would do so. I'd also say to you, if you're going through a very difficult or trying season, know this, God is faithful. He loves you. We love you. And we just say to you today, that he is still able to do exceedingly abundantly what we could ever ask or think. So I speak blessings over you and your family. Thank you for joining us today.